Oh, okay. So yeah, thank you very much. And so, um, you know, the, the summary for this is that, you know, there's a lot of bridges in the, in the Quad Cities history and, and, you know, they've had a lot of impact on uh, commerce and the economy in general. Uh, the ones that we're gonna be really focusing on are the ones that have gone across, specifically across the uh, Arsenal Island and their impact on the local community, but also on the Arsenal itself and uh, all the you know, trials and tribulations that those bridges have caused over the years. So what you see here is actually a, a map of uh, what Rock Island Arsenal looked like in the very earliest, right after the establishment in 1862. And uh, what you can see in the middle here is the uh, Rock Island Prison Barracks where the Confederate Prisoner War Camp was uh, established in 1863. And we'll actually be talking about that next month. But uh, over the uh, left third of the island is the, the very first bridge um, across the Mississippi River, uh, very first river bridge across the Mississippi River, I should say. <laughs> Um, and the very first bridge across the Arsenal Island here. So, uh, but starting out, you know, I really wanted to show kind of a progression from the 1830s and the left map over here uh, of railway uh, construction throughout the United States. And so 1830s, you know, there's only a few little red spots on that map. Um, but as we get up to the 1850s, you know, they start encroaching more and more into uh, obviously areas of economic, uh, you know, commerce area. Uh, but the area we'll be focusing on is right here, uh, here in, outside of Chicago. And really what I wanted to point out is that previously up and down the Mississippi River, the only way for commerce to get from the Quad City or the Tri-Cities at the time to you know, New York or Boston or the East Coast was obviously by water, uh, either going down the Mississippi and around Florida and up, or by land up to the Great Lakes and then by water to uh, the, the larger cities. And either way, um, either way, it was about a month to two months, depending on, uh, you know, the, the current conditions. And, you know, so you get anything that you wanted to manufacture here, it'd be about that time to, uh, to get to the coast. So as these new railway developments were coming through, what you can see is that from uh, Rock Island, Illinois, to New York would be about three days. So, you know, you're just dramatically uh, decreased that, that timeline of getting commerce from one area to another. And what I want to show here is the, uh, the you know, basically an enlarged view with Lake Michigan, Chicago, and then the Mississippi River over to the left side of Rock Island and showing all the bridges along this route um, and they're kind of their milestones going all the way uh, through here. So you'll actually see, this is actually the, uh, well, from Chicago all the way down, it's the Chicago and Rock Island Railway. And uh, some of the big uh, names that you'll hear here, uh, like Henry Farnham, um, you know, were influential in this uh, uh, construction, but, you know, as a, as a kind of a secondary means is that they were all really pushing initially that uh, the, uh, the channels, you know, you know, using waterways to connect, you know, uh, these different areas, you know, going from river to river, if there was a land bridge like Chicago or up through the, uh, 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 the I'm sorry, up through Wisconsin over to the Great Lakes, but connecting them with waterways instead of railways. And then when that kind of dried up for the a pun intended here. Uh, railways kind of came in with the, uh, the evolution and advancement of uh, steam locomotives. And so you see there, um, the line gets to Rock Island, the city of Rock Island, February 22nd, 1854. And this is the next map in progression showing 1860 to highlight a different point here. And we're, uh, I'm sorry, right, right about here. So in between this time period, 1850 and 1860, you, know, you see this massive division in the United States. You know, you see um, obviously North versus South, and there's a lot of pressure for economic development on one side or the other. And people are starting to already, you know, get into their camps of who they're going to be defending or promoting. And so uh, in that time period between 1850 and 1860, there was a lot of efforts trying to be the first one to cross the Mississippi River, because wherever that would happen would drive economic advancement in that area or that region. And so going to here, like, uh, like I mentioned, Henry Farm and, and Joseph Sheffield were some of the, the movers getting the railway to uh, the city of Rock Island. Um, and they were driving through the, uh, the Chicago and Rock Island Railway Company. Uh, but there was also an effort by the Mississippi and Missouri Railway west of the river from Davenport to uh, Council Bluffs that had been collated in 1853. So the only thing that was separating these two railways from being connected, uh, you know, was, was the river. Obviously, there was ferries moving stuff across the river. But um, if you could have that vital connection, then you're having basically a huge explosion of access to the west uh, or areas west of the Mississippi. Um, 
Now, the reason why Rock Island was one of these contenders, and there was really six major efforts trying to cross the Mississippi between uh, you know, the headwaters and uh, the Gulf of Mexico. The reason why Rock Island was a contender here is that this is a map that, uh, or a survey drawn by uh, Lieutenant Robert E. Lee at the time, you know, future con uh, Confederate general, of showing the rapids around this, the uh, island of Rock Island um, that we know today. And so all these numbers here, or all these little dots or numbers showing the can uh, channels uh, through the rapids. So it, it was a very treacherous point in the Mississippi River. It was the most treacherous point for, for that fact. And so because of this unique geology, it made it really easy to be able to build, uh, build bridge piers going across the island that would support a railway. Uh, and another part to this too is that what we know as Arsenal Island today was still owned by the federal government. Fort Armstrong had been established in 1816, and it was now defunct by 1845. The federal government still owned it, uh, but there was really in a, in a stage of flux where the, uh, the War Department had tried to sell it, auction a couple of times, pulled it off the auction block saying, hey, this still could be something we're interested in. But there were a lot of squatters still left on the island. The Davenport family, even though Davenport had been killed, uh, still owned a big section of land on the western side of the island. Uh, the Sears family owned uh, land on the east side of the island. And so there was really no, uh, the federal government wasn't stopping anybody from living on the island. But uh, when the idea of the railroad, uh, railroad came through, now it was a big deal. So this is that full map showing Arsenal Island almost all the way up to Leclerc, showing the rapids, uh, what was known as Rock Island Rapids. Um, so you can kind of see how treacherous that point of the river was. Um, <clears throat> to add, um, not insult to injury, but add more fuel to the fire here, is that in 1853, the Illinois legislature had passed a law basically saying that uh, railroads or public transportation methods had right of way over public lands. Now, the public lands is kind of in quotes where it's like Illinois could only govern lands that were publicly owned by Illinois. But then they claimed that, well, you can have this right of way over federal lands because we say so. Now, the, the uh, War Department had a problem with this. Um, and so the railroad company having this law go forward, they, they saw this as a green light, started construction, uh, construction on the bridge uh, going across Arsenal Island, began 16 uh, July, 1853. But the Secretary of War, basically the equivalent of the Secretary of Defense State was Jefferson Davis, future president of the Confederacy. And he was promoting these rail lines across the Mississippi River in the South. He didn't want the North to have that economic advantage. And so he kept sending out federal marshals you know, orders to cease uh, construction of the bridge. The last federal marshal came out and, you know, the bridge was already basically 90% built and he comes back to Jefferson Davis. What do you want me to do? Tear it down? You know, it, it, was, it was kind of in a rock and a hard place. But uh, this is actually uh, a bond that the uh, Mississippi and Missouri Railway Company issued out. <clears throat> this one being unredeemed or even un unsold, I should say, number 1474, but showing how they were trying to you know, raise funds for this. This was actually being sold in the city of New York, you know, seeing that, well, you buy this bond and when the railway flourishes, you're going to get economic, you know, uh, return on this investment. And the, uh, the drawing here actually shows what the concept of the, uh, eight, uh, what we know as the 1856 bridge uh, would look like. This is uh, the actual design. <clears throat> um, it had three spans on the, the Davenport side, a swing span in the middle to allow, uh, you know, freedom of uh, transportation for any boats up and down the river, and then two spans on the uh, the south side closest to Arsenal Island. Um, now, believe it or not, this was 100% wood construction, you know, and <clears throat> a single track going across, but, uh, you know, completed by uh, 18, or April of 1856. Um, now, kind of continuing on this, uh, this conflict between Jefferson Davis and uh, the railway company, the, uh, there was actually filed suit, or the War Department filed suit in the United States versus the railroad company uh, to stop them in, uh, in this you know, uh, construction of the, uh, the bridge. Now, the judge ruled, federal judge ruled that, well, basically that this is a federal uh, or a, a public transportation project and that they were benefiting the larger public as a whole. And so they would basically have right of way to build over federal land uh, according to this you know, Illinois state law. And so the uh, War Department's claims that in attempt to try to stop them from constructing the, uh, the bridge across federal lands really fell apart. So Jefferson, Day, uh, Jefferson Davis gave up at that point. And, uh, you know, it, I think it was a.
was a secretary of war anyway. So, but this is a sketch showing what the concept of the bridge would look like even prior to it, uh, its construction uh, going over into, into Davenport there. Uh, <clears throat> another sketch here to the right, but the bridge was constructed or completed uh, 21 April, 1856. There was a lot of fanfare, you know, uh, steam engines going across the bridge, you know, blowing their whistles, you know, having a great day. Uh, the, uh, the first couple of trains go across the bridge and, you know, connect with the, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, um, Missouri, sorry, I, I completely uh, mind blanked on the, uh, the name of the other railway. But uh, anyway, they connect with the other railway and, you know, almost instantly uh, uh, cargo starts going across the, uh, the ship. Now, the unhappiest people with this, other than Jefferson Davis and the War Department, were the riverboat captains. They saw this as a threat to their livelihood that, uh, you know, if we could get cargo from, you know, Rock Island to New York City in three days, why would you need riverboats anymore? And so almost instantly there were protests, there were uh, threats coming from railroad captains saying we're going to burn the bridge down, you know, uh, and really just causing a lot of protests here. So not surprisingly, here's another picture. This is actually a picture from uh, just shortly after the bridge is complete from Davenport looking towards Arsenal Island. Island. <clears throat> and right in the middle, you can see the, uh, the large bridge pier uh, where the swing span sits. Now, one of the things that will come in later to this is that the, the bridge piers they're sitting on the bedrock at the bottom of the river. They're not anchored to it. And so um, the later bridge you'll see in a heavy ice flow or weather conditions, the bridge is actually moved downstream a little bit. Huh. Um, but, um, and then this is a map showing the current day arsenal here with the uh, Confederate prisoner of war camp in the background, and then the route of the 1856 bridge. And just another look going from Arsenal Island towards Davenport the other way. Now, not surprisingly, one uh, less than one month later, uh, there's an accident at the bridge. So um, there's a storm that blew into Davenport the night of uh, 5 May 1856. Uh, boats had all docked on the on the west side of uh, the bridge, and the morning of the sixth, with a nice bright sunny day, uh, the waters are calm, and so all the boats start pulling off the docks to get through the bridge. Now that's open, waiting for them to go through. Um, a steamboat named the Effie Afton had never been north of St. Louis at this point, had no real uh, manifest for why it was going up past St. Louis, um, but it was bound and determined to be the first one through this bridge to the point that after it pulls off its dock, there's another boat that's actually in front of it. It crashes into that boat and then moves on past it damaging the other boat's rudder and parts of the F.E. Afton as well. But they were unfazed. They were bound and determined to get through. So they were carrying so much speed that as they got in between the piers of the bridge with the swing span open, the boat starts cavitating. So going back and forth in between the piers, it gets just past the pier on the east side of the bridge, loses power, and then floats back into the bridge pier itself and gets stuck. Now, uh, the crew has enough time to get all the passengers off and even starting to get some of the cargo off the ship. And um, we'll talk about the court case in a second, but it came out during the court case that several people heard the captain of the ship telling his first mate that, hey, we're not insured for, for damage or accidents, we're only insured for fire. So I know it's gonna shock everybody, but within you know about 30 minutes of that comment being heard by several people, the boat burst into flames and completely burns down to the water, burns an entire span of the bridge. Uh, the boat dislodges itself and floats downstream and sinks right about where the, uh, the dam is today. Um, and within months of after this accident happened, the uh, 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 captain of this uh, riverboat and the owner, uh, along with a, a whole team of other riverboat captains filed suit against the railroad company saying that the bridge now is an impediment to their uh, to the right of way, um, that it's a dangerous thing in the middle of the river. And so they start this large uh, lawsuit uh, against the railroad companies. Um, and so this is actually uh, one of the uh, original newspapers talking about uh, the F.E. Afton crash and, and how none of the riverboat captains were all that upset about it, that they were actually, there were accounts of them blowing their whistles and celebrating as the, uh, the bridge uh, is catching fire. Um, and so there weren't many, you know, many tears shed for the bridge at that point. But um, um, in, in the court case, it comes out that, well, there was a small fire that had started and then the fire got put out. 
And then the captain's overheard saying that they're not insured for accidents. And then all of a sudden, a larger fire starts in mean, multiple parts of the ship and then burns the whole ship down. No crew, no cargo, no, no personnel or, or uh, passengers are hurt in the, uh, in the ensuing blaze. Um, now, the bridge is, despite the, the, the extensive damage, it's rebuilt by, by September. But the, uh, the court case, which was heard versus, uh, uh, I'm sorry, heard versus the railroad company, uh, comes out and um, it is lauded as being the case of the century, right? This is going to be the biggest court case that's going to have, you know, determine is technology bad and, you know, riverboat captains in the old way of life is going to be the best way. Um, and their main comment or their main argument was that the, uh, uh, the currents and eddies caused by the bridge piers caused an impediment or caused a dangerous river traffic to go through, despite the fact that even the largest riverboat on the Mississippi, the bridge span was larger than that by like six feet. So there was, should, be, should have been no issue of the bridge going through. So with this uh, trial of the century that came out, uh, a up and coming lawyer that was known for his, um, the way that he would uh, a, approach uh, members of the jury and, and uh, court case, you know, by appealing to their, you know, uh, humble nature. Uh, this lawyer named Abraham Lincoln was hired to defend the railway companies. And he'd actually worked on other court cases as well. And since we're in the library too, uh, there's two books, The uh, Hell's Gate of the Mississippi, and then also the, the uh, Lincoln's Greatest Case, which are all are both books uh, specifically tied to this count of the F.E. Afton and the ensuing court cases after that. And the interesting thing about those court cases too is that because of the Chicago fire, many of the original records were destroyed, but there was such uh, you know, attention put to this case that newspapers were covering it so closely that you could actually rebuild most of the court case because of the newspaper accounts. Um, and because this the case was so big, a legal dream team was hired and Abraham Lincoln was one, of, was one of those. And I always like the quote here that Lincoln was one of the best men to state the case forcefully and convincingly that I have ever heard. Um, and his personality will appeal to the judge and jury because he was a backwoods lawyer that you know, could speak to the common man kind of thing and which, uh, what he was believed. So in the uh, course of the research for this case, Lincoln actually takes um, a train takes the same train to Rock Island to study the uh, the arsenal, or I'm sorry, to study the bridge going across Arsenal Island. Um, and there's a <laughs> one of these uh, myths that's uh, kind of unproven myths that he's standing on the bridge looking down as they're reconstructing the bridge to see if there's any dangerous currents there. And a little boy comes up and he asks the little boy to throw a stick into the, in the river to see if the stick will you know get you know swished around in the uh, the current. And, and then he asked the boy, do you think this is dangerous? And the boy's like, no, no, it's, it's, it's fine. Well, it turned out that that little boy, at least in the story, was one of the uh, bridge builder's uh, sons. So he was, you know, towing the line, to, you know, towing the, the bridge that his dad built was, uh, was great. Um, but uh, the initial case that Abraham Lincoln worked on ended up going uh, to a, a, hung, uh, a hung jury, but eventually it appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court. And so those of us that drive to uh, Arsenal Island or drive across the government bridge, you know, we always kind of joke that if you get stuck waiting for a boat um, or waiting for the bridge to close because of the boat locking through, it's because of this case. Uh, because in the Supreme Court, it was actually found or it um, basically that the river track would have the right of way. But they said that in that case that the bridge was not causing an impediment to the travel of the river traffic uh, going up and downstream. So the bridge could remain, but river traffic would always have the right of way. And so, you know, it was always kind of a, a weird um, occurrence where you're actually looking at the uh, the embankment going on the, either side of the bridge now, and you'll see a train stop waiting for a boat to lock through because the boats have the right of way over everybody else. So, and that all comes out of this case here. Um, now, it, it gets to the Supreme Court when he's president, so I'm sure he was giving a close eye and watching what was going on here. But um, following 1856, the bridge is like quickly rebuilt, like I said, by September. Um, that bridge remains in place until about 1866. 10 years later. Um, and over that time, there was so much rail traffic, the engines are getting so much bigger, the, tra uh, the, the train loads are getting so much bigger that they determined they needed to build a, a more hardy bridge. And so it's built in the same location. That bridge has nothing but problems. Um, heavy ice flow, it's plagued by these heavy ice flows. Um, and uh, I was gonna show a picture here, but that uh, pillar right there is actually what remained of the, uh, the bridge pillar from the 1856 and 1866 bridge. Uh, this is what the, the monument on Arsenal Island shows today, made of the original bricks 
from that, uh, that original bridge pillar going across the island. But this is the 1866 bridge, and you can see how the bridge is curved. It's not supposed to do that. Uh, this was actually uh, part, this was damaged from a tornado that went across the bridge, damaging the swing span of the bridge. But uh, this was not the first time. There were a couple of times that ice flows had pushed pillars or the piers of the bridge down by multiple feet, 10 to 15 feet in some cases. So the bridge would be re rebuilt. Um, but really by the uh, you know, late 1860s, uh, uh, early 1870s, it was determined that this bridge was too weak. Uh, it was all strictly wood still, even though it was bigger than the, the original bridge. And so uh, with that and now the construction of the national arsenal under uh, General Rodman, it was determined that we need to build an iron bridge and we want to build it on the west side of the arsenal or Arsenal Island. And so this is a uh, Rock Island Arsenal here. The city of Davenport off to the, uh, the northwest there or, or top left. Uh, the 1856 and 1866 bridge go right across the, uh, about the third way of the, uh, across the, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a third of the way across the island. The 1872 bridge we'll talk about in a second here and the government bridge are moved all the way to the furthermost west part of the island to make the most room for the new arsenal that's gonna be built. Um, and, uh, you know, to have this kind of grand plan that uh, Rodman wanted. Now, when I say the national arsenal, everything that the army wanted or needed was intended to be built at, at Rock Island Arsenal. Um, everything from uniforms to boots to weapons to artillery. And so Rodman was planning this huge, vast complex of an arsenal. And he needed as much room as he could get for that. And so that was part of his plan to move it to the western side of the island. Now, we always hear of budget issues um, today. Well, they had the same problem back then. Rodman had originally designed a much larger bridge and a dual track bridge. So there were actually two train tracks that ran across the top. Um, now, the problem was is that that bridge cost, it was like double basically the appropriation that Congress had laid out for that bridge. And so he actually writes back and forth to the ordinance department so many times that he bugs them so much that they say, okay, guess what? You're not building it anymore. And they give it over to the uh, engineer department or today's uh, equivalent of the Corps of Engineers. And they build it. And then they say, Rodman, here's your bridge. Um, and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Flagler, his second in command, Rodman's second in command, I should say, wrote that uh, General Rodman was so deeply interested and took such great pride in his original bridge design that when it was taken away from him, that it was a serious blow to his, uh, his personality. Uh, now, unfortunately for Rodman, um, you know, he didn't live very long after this. So he dies in June of 1871. And so he never sees the, uh, the bridge come to completion. But uh, the other unique thing, features that he didn't design to do it is that all the previous bridges, the other two previous bridges, had only been a railway bridge. This one actually had dual span, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, dual span bridge. So the lower track of the bridge was meant for uh, wagon traffic and foot traffic. Um, and part of the reason why they always talk about part of the reason why the railroad goes on top. And one of the reasons why Rodman designed it that way was so that when the wagon traffic pulled by horses going across, that if there was a train underneath, the steam would come up and spook the horses. And so we drive on the lower span of the bridge today because they didn't want to spook horses. Uh, and so that's the way it was designed originally. Uh, the picture to the bridge, or I'm sorry, to the left is the 1872 bridge shortly after it was open. Um, you can see the, uh, the lower track here for pedestrian traffic, the upper track for the single track uh, bridge now. Um, and, you know, so some of Rodman's ideas had come to fruition. The bridge is completed, uh, completed by 1870, February of 1873, excuse me. Uh, now, the difference between this bridge and the previous bridges is that it's wrought iron construction. Uh, there's really no wood. Some of the, the wood, uh, the deck is wood, but uh, the overall construction of the bridge is wrought iron, so much, much stronger. And this becomes a very first, known as the very first government bridge here. Um, but unfortunately, uh, as things go, the traffic over this bridge really outpaced its structural capacity. And so almost immediately, within about a year or two, they see that Rodman was right. It should have been a much larger bridge. It should have had two tracks um, across the top. And so uh, within a few years, they start designing a new bridge to replace this one. But th these are the views. Uh, the picture to the left is from Arsenal Island looking over towards Davenport. If uh, we can probably see the library here um, in the background. Uh, and then the other the picture to the right is from Davenport looking towards Arsenal Island. And one of the things we, uh, we like to talk about too is the eagle and the, the shield up at the top of the bridge. 
that those had gone missing. They were actually saved off of the bridge and then disappeared. And so, you know, they, they were actually supposed to be kept by the arsenal, uh, you know, in, in its historic collection that it had. And uh, so there's always rumors that, well, they're hiding in the Putnam Museum somewhere that, you know, nobody's found it. But so I was, <laughs> I threw out the last talk. If you see a, an eagle with a shield like that, let us know. <laughs> we're still looking for it. Uh, but, uh, and then this is the, uh, the view of the, uh, the lower track of the bridge. So you can see how much narrower it is in the current day. Uh, but, uh, you know, at the wagon level, I should say. One of the other additions that they did to this bridge is they actually added tracks that ran across the middle of the bridge and had horse-drawn trolley system that, or horse-drawn or mule-drawn trolley system for the short time that this bridge was open. But uh, I, like I always talk about too, is we still need passes. You know, people talk about getting onto the arsenal. It's so hard to get passes. Well, they had to have passes back then too. And this is actually a pass to get onto the arsenal. The flip side of this would have your name and would be signed by the commander. But this had all kinds of rules that you can't do on the island. There's uh, no smoking, shooting, or fishing from the island. Uh, no fast driving across the bridge. You had to walk your horses across the bridge. Don't pull the flowers or shrubs on the arsenal island. Um, and if you did any of that, you'd have to give your pass up. So, you know, it's, a, it's still strongly discouraged to do almost any of that on the arsenal today. Um, but nevertheless, uh, that's a, a pass from 1888. Um, now, after they de decided they were going to rebuild this bridge into a larger bridge uh, to fully fulfill Rodman's plan, uh, there was actually a heavy ice flow in February of 1896 that while they were reconstructing the bridge, it actually pushed um, some of the construction boats that were or barges that were up against the bridge and completely destroyed the activities that were going on. And so that's actually a rail cart with the uh, clock tower in the background from the railway transport of this, uh, of this bridge. Uh, and so right here is actually Armstrong Avenue and what we would know as the, uh, the Davenport Gate today where that action is. And off to the right side is showing some of the crews rebuilding the, uh, the truss work to construct the new bridge. So this is actually the drawing of what the new bridge would look like. The swing span was moved closer to the arsenal side with, uh, in, in the uh, 1920s, there would be a lock and dam uh, or lock system put underneath that bridge as well. But uh, to show you the difference that in 1874, there were 301 trains that would go across the bridge. A hundred years later, there was uh, three times as many trains uh, going across the bridge with uh, 570,000 cars. So it was definitely taking its, uh, its share, full share or a fair share of that. Now in talking to the Corps of Engineers state too, uh, the, uh, the bridge was so over-designed that even fully loaded with two trains and full vehicle traffic on it, that it only uses about 15% of its structural capacity. And so, <coughs> excuse me, the bridge designer was Ralph Majeski. And this was one of his first bridges that he would design. And it was so overbuilt, over-constructed, that there was never any fear that it was ever going to have, um, you know, basically fulfilling Rodman's plan. It was never going to have any issues, uh, you know, uh, fulfilling all the traffic going across it. And I always like this picture too. So this is at the arsenal here, getting onto the bridge and one of the very first traffic jams in 1896, waiting for the bridge to close. So, you know, we sit there in our cars thinking about this with the air conditioning and all these people are sitting here in their, their wagons waiting for the bridge to close after a, a boat going through. Um, but, uh, the overall design was a Pratt Baltimore truss system uh, with, and, and as opposed to the previous bridge with iron construction, this is all steel construction. So a much, much uh, larger bridge or a, a much better built bridge. Uh, now, the surprising thing is that all the piers that the bridge is built on were using the original 1871 piers. And these were different than all the previous ones, all the previous piers in the 1856 or 66 bridge. These were actually completely set into the bedrock at the bottom of the river. So there was no issue of them you know, put, being pushed downstream by any heavy ice flows. Um, another unique uh, capability of this bridge is that the, the, the swing span, even designed in 1896, could do 360 degrees, where most bridges can only open one way and you know, close, they can't go all the way around. Um, and the Corps still tells us today that the bridge is so well balanced from time it was designed that the wind, a heavy wind could actually blow the bridge open uh, when the clutch is taken off. So, um, and it really, for the most part, the bridge has not changed in design uh, without any, or, or any major modifications since 1896. These are some other views. 
This is actually a view looking at the, uh, the rail surface uh, with the roadway surface down below it uh, in 1896, just shortly before it's completed. Uh, <clears throat> and this picture onto the right, actually looking from the city of Davenport towards Arsenal Island, you can see the clock tower in the background there after it's completed there. Uh, this is actually uh, about circa 1900, showing uh, the, the larger pier that the, uh, the swing span is, uh, is anchored on. Uh, and in about another 20 years, they actually start building uh, or start construction of the, uh, the lock and dam system. So the lock's going on either side of the bridge here and then the dam just west or south of the, uh, southwest of the, uh, the, the bridge itself. Um, now, I, I mentioned the, uh, the trolley system of the, uh, the previous bridge. That was something that was re-envisioned on this bridge as well, but instead of being horse-drawn, it was actually an electric trolley system. And so on the lower span of the bridge, where the cars and, and still, yes, the horse-drawn carts would go, there was actually a trolley system that would go onto the arsenal. And one of the things that uh, in our research, when we were talking about influenza, one of the things that popped up was that it was talking about how uh, during the war, there was such a huge influx of workers to the arsenal that the trolleys were constantly full. And so when influenza starts um, rearing its ugly head during the war, uh, there were signs of you know, uh, maximum capacities on these trolleys where they actually said people were hanging onto the outside of the trolley to get onto the arsenal for work. Uh, they were limiting the number of people on, you had to wear your face mask on the, on the trolley and you didn't have to, or you, you, you were urged not to touch anybody else. So you can imagine a packed trolley not touching anybody. Um, but uh, this trolley system stays in operation until about 1940 when it's just completely paved over and not used anymore. So really 126 years of design that has largely uh, no modifications in general. Um, and one of the things to point out too is that with Ralph Majeski, um, having this be his first bridge in design uh, in 1896, he goes on to construct, I think it's like 32 some odd, or, uh, or it's, I'm sorry, design 32 more bridges over his time period. And uh, one of the most notable bridges is the San Francisco Bay Bridge. But they say that he actually bookends Rock Island Arsenal, or bookends his career with Rock Island Arsenal, where that was his first bridge. Uh, yes, sir. Is that the Golden Gate? Oh, the Bay Bridge? Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's the one that goes from Oakland to uh, the city of San Francisco. Oh, okay. um, the Golden Gate goes from San Francisco to the Marin, <clears throat> Marin County. But uh, the very last bridge that he designs, Ralph Majeski, was the I-74 bridge. So that uh, his first one was on the left side of the arsenal or the west side, and his last one was on the east side of the arsenal. It doesn't touch it, but, um, and that one was completed in 1933. That's the old Battendorf Bridge. So Correct, yeah. The uh, one before, the one that was just, is being torn down now. Correct, yeah, it's a more green colored one. Uh, and then this is a, a view looking through the, uh, the center of the bridge here in 1900 with the horse-drawn cart riding on the, uh, the trolley tracks here <laughs> as well. And, uh, <laughs> For those of us who have driven across the bridge, you'll notice the uh, uh, the same plaques that still remain uh, from 1900 to today. And then this is kind of a, uh, a little gif or a short video that I wanted to show, uh, showing a barge locking through and how the swing span completely turns 360 degrees uh, to have the barge uh, the barges go through. Uh, and to, for a plug for the arsenal. The uh, Corps of Engineers actually has uh, a, a, a Mississippi Valley Visitor Center on the very western side of the arsenal, right about here in this picture, to where you can actually go up and go into the visitor center and I'd watch the, uh, the boats lock through. So you can see how the lock works and everything like that, uh, the water raising and lowering, and then watch the bridge open and close with that. And they've got great educational resources there as well. So uh, I think uh, another plug for the arsenal, we're open. So please come get your visitor pass through the Moline Gate. And uh, you can get on the arsenal and see all these great things, uh, these great pieces of history that we have to share. So one of the things I wanted to point out here too, or share was that uh, while the Northern side of the 1856 gets all the attention about where it was and that it was the first bridge across the Mississippi River. One of the things that we were actually asked to do is that uh, was to find the Southern span of the bridge. The northern span is, is really well documented and the southern span really kind of um, goes into obsolescence and then disappears um, over time. But this is Arsenal Island right here and the current railroad bridge leaving Arsenal Island. And then the, the uh, Rock Island Arsenal Avenue that turns into uh, Ar uh, Armstrong Avenue going into the Rock Island gate there. And then the shaded portion of the back is the original outline of Arsenal Island with the 1856 bridge going across the island. 
Now, overlaying two maps is easy to do, but we, with the help of the uh, Rock Island Arsenal Fire Department and their side scan sonar on their boat, we went out to map if there was anything remaining of it. Um, now, after General Rodman dies, Lieutenant Colonel Flagler takes over you know, construction of the arsenal and the 1872 bridge. Um, and when he talks about destruction of the 1856 bridge, you know, he said that uh, originally they worried about the span going across the Mississippi proper. And they, they didn't really worry about this because the contractors were supposed to take both portions out when they deconstructed the bridge. Well, this bridge never really gets deconstructed, just basically falls, uh, you know, uh, ages over time and falls down into the river, now causing an impediment for any river traffic on the uh, Sylvan Sluice side. And so he comes back and actually doesn't sue, but strongly encourages the contractor to come back and clean up their mess that they were supposed to do. And so these dots here show uh, or correlate with these sonar images going across, showing where the piers uh, are still remain. And so Rodman in his original uh, uh, orders for destruction of this bridge that they had to reduce any uh, <coughs> destruction of the bridge 17 inches below low water level. And so when we went out, we could actually find the uh, raised embankment. So 66 is right here. You can find the raised embankment um, and then portions of the original stone piers uh, for the, uh, the original bridge going across there. And so we were, we were pretty pleased that we were able to, uh, to mark this. And then this is showing there was an embankment that came out into the Sylvan Slough here. And so 71 and 72, you could really see a pronounced embankment um, showing where the original portion of the, uh, the bridge was. And there's a nonprofit organization in uh, Davenport that actually is wanting to co help commemorate the, uh, the bridge itself. Um, and the, we have the, uh, the plaque that I showed on the north side of uh, Arsenal Island. And then they have another uh, corresponding plaque in Davenport showing where the bridge uh, connected over to Davenport. And today, the, uh, the brand new YMCA in Davenport, uh, the, the hill right behind it is the original embankment for the 1856 bridge that still remains today. And when they were doing the construction, they actually found portions of the original rail lines on top of that, uh, that hill. Uh, so, but they wanted to do the same thing on the south side, showing on the Rock Island Bank and then on the Arsenal side where that original bridge was. And so this was part of our survey for that to prove where the bridge was originally uh, and that it was there and tell that story too. So I, I know it's kind of a geeky historian thing, but we were pretty pleased that we were able to find all these uh, bits and pieces of it. So, um, and with that, uh, I know I'm a little bit shorter on this one, but uh, did you guys have any questions about any parts of this or? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, how does the construction of the bridges relate to the construction of the dams and the increased navigability of the, and the use of the, of the locks and stuff? Yeah, so uh, the 1896 bridge, is constructed, and then in uh, 1926, the uh, the first dam uh, okay. is constructed. And as a part of the uh, construction of the dam, they had to build the locks in here. And this is a very unique lock as well, where there's uh, an inboard and outboard lock, so that um, you know there's always basically a lock that can be remain open. Now they almost always use the uh, the inboard one, like you see in the image here. But uh, the the lock. Uh, oh, and I forgot to point out too is that when they started digging uh, or dredging this waterway for the lock system to go through, yeah. they actually ran into the epiaftin. That uh, <laughs> there were portions of the burnt epiaftin that were still sitting on the, the bottom of the uh, the river, and the bell for the epiaftin was recovered by these dredging crews. And so the museum actually has the original bell, or the Rock Island Arsenal Museum has the original bell, which you can see when it reopens in spring of uh, next year. But uh, the unique thing about that bell is it's all broken. And you'd think, okay, well, the, it was a dredging that broke it, right? Well, no, it was actually dredged up in one complete piece. The contractors that were hired to do the dredging actually broke the bell up and were trying to sell portions of the bell off. And when the government found out about that, they said, well, no, you know, yeah. we're pretty upset. You got to get all the pieces back. Yeah. Um, and so what we have of the remaining of the bell today is all those pieces that were reconstructed, put back together. Um, and kind of a funny story, a couple of years ago, uh, there's a pretty pronounced hole in one side that's a little triangular shaped hole in the side of the bell. Um, You've got somebody, that piece, right? <laughs> well, somebody came into the museum and said, I think I have a piece of the bell. <laughs> and uh, he was kind of cautious as to bringing it in. They said, okay, well, take an outline of it and bring it in. We'll put it up to the bell. 
Well, sure, sure, sure enough, it fit exactly in that one spot that was missing on the side of the bell and said, well, you know, hey, compelling to your better nature, you know, if you want to bring it in and never came back. So, <laughs> somebody out there has a, a confirmed piece of the F.E. Afton bill uh, that, uh, that was proven at least by a sketch. So, but um, so if that answers your question about the, the lock and yeah, dam. Was the channel on the other side of the river, though, initially seemed to be in those real early? Uh, yeah, the, the channel was actually a little bit deeper out or a little bit closer to the middle. Um, oh, okay, where the original swing span was. Correct. Uh, yeah, but in the 1871, and I'm sorry, 1872 bridge and 1896 bridge, both swing span for here. Okay. So um, going back to the 1856, and, and I think it was because they were actually following the, the channel going down the Rock Island Rapids. And so that was the deepest part of the river. So to keep in mind, too, is that when the dam goes in, it raises the level of the river at this point right. by 10 to 12 feet. Right. Um, and so you're not worried about the rapids anymore once the dam goes in. But all the previous bridges had to be worried about, well, where is the most navigable point of the channel uh, for, the, uh, for the river traffic? Um, and, and I didn't mention earlier, but one of the reasons why Davenport and LeClaire exist um, as cities is because during the low water years, you couldn't get a loaded boat through the rapids. And so you actually had to offload your cargo on, sh on shore, move it by land to one city or the other so that you could light your boat up to get through. Um, and so, you know, we always wonder, well, why does this city exist? You know, it's just, you know, a steamboat stop. Well, it, it was to get people through the, uh, the rapids here. Well, wow, there was good fishing there too. Yeah, yeah. Well, and there's all <laughs> kinds of great stories of fishing at the end of the dam now too, for the monster catfish that come out of there. Yeah, yeah. But uh, sturgeon. Yes. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, there, you know, really, these bridges, you know, going across Arsenal Island really um, aid the uh, economic impact or uh, economic development of the Tri City area into the Quad City area because they bring a lot of railroad traffic in, a lot of commerce in, and eventually the riverboat captains learn to embrace uh, the bridges because instead of taking, you know, a month or a month and a half or two months to get around to New York City to deliver their cargo, they could come down to Davenport or Rock Island, offload their cargo, and it could be to market within several days. And so it ended up costing them a lot less, you know, uh, to transport their, their goods to the, uh, the East Coast or wherever it needs to go, Chicago or further east. So, you know, it, it ends up actually working for it, but you do see the, uh, the slow decline of, uh, of riverboat traffic up and down the Mississippi after this. So, uh, but there's all kinds of great stories about, um, you know, the, uh, the bridges and the impacts of the, of the bridges and the parades. Like for example, the uh, 1918, uh, the Victory Day Parade uh, or Armistice Day Parade, uh, that uh, the parades, despite the influenza pandemic, uh, the largest parades that uh, the, the Quad Cities had ever seen actually came across the bridges. Um, it had basically had all four cities partying that the uh, the war was over. So, um, you know, and, and the, the uh, government bridge was kind of at the core of that. So, were there any other questions? Oh, yes. Were the walkways part of the original um, design of the bridge? And then when did they add the roadway that we drive across to get from? Yeah, that's a good question. So the 1872 bridge, um, uh, or 1870, uh, yeah, 1872 bridge actually did have walkways that went across on either side as well. Uh, in the 1896 bridge, that was a, a part of the original design as well. Uh, so those were always core to the design. Now the roadway surface was kind of interesting that um, the the surface that we drive on was originally um, either wood uh, or wood laid or dirt laid over the top of it. Um, it actually had a period where it was concrete. Um, and then uh, all the, the steel that was below the roadway surface was eventually removed. And then the grading that we see today, open grading uh, that we see today was added. Uh, and I believe that was for basically the uh, you know, water runoff and so that the, uh, the water coming off the train trestle could uh, go through the bridge as well. But uh, so this iteration is uh, the longest point in the, the bridge's history that we've seen. I, I think it's been at least, uh, I think it was the 1950s that that was changed, if I remember, remember correctly. Um, to the open grading there. So that's the, the current roadway surface. And that's really the only thing that's changed on the bridge um, in any significant way. The, uh, the two train uh, tracks on the top are basically all the same. And, and it's really, it's neat. If you ever get to, uh, the chance to be on either, I know that's just doing a loop, but uh, on either bank or either side of the bridge, to think that this was technology that was from 1896, where the bridge actually opens up levers or little feet on either side of the bridge in order for it to clear and then spin around. 
Um, and the gearing, basically all the mechanism that sits underneath the bridge is all the original mechanism, but you know, with a few exceptions uh, that was installed in 1896. So, you know, we got our money's worth out of this bridge and, and it's unique too, because this is one of the few bridges in the country that is actually owned by specifically by the army. Uh, it, even till today, I think there's under, under 10 bridges that are like that. So, um, did that answer your question? Yeah, and yeah. then the roadway that connects them to Rock Island oh. on the other side, when did that get? Uh, yes, there? so that was actually, um, uh, that was, if I remember correctly, that was something, um, that was a roadway from uh, basically the start of the arsenal. And in sometime in the, uh, the late 1850s, there was a roadway or wagon path that went across there because that was the main access to the, uh, to the arsenal. Um, and then there was a, a rail line or a rail hub that actually came on the arsenal through there too, uh, that fed like all the Confederate prisoners came in through there. Uh, but it was just the 1856 bridge location on the, the Western third, that was the main thoroughfare. Um, but uh, basically all the other, tracks and all the, the pedestrian traffic came on in that side. There was a later bridge uh, where the current Moline Bridge is today. Um, and I think that one, uh, that was first put in, well, there was a bridge there when David Sears was there, but it was just, it wasn't a commercial bridge. It was a personal one going from the city of Moline to Arsenal Island. And that was in, later improved um, in, I think, 1920 and made into a larger public bridge. Um, so if I remember correctly, but, uh, but yeah, so on, on both sides of the island, that those were, were later additions that uh, grew to uh, meet the increasing demand. Uh, I can I can tell you, my grandfather uh, ran maintenance at the arsenal, and he used to make parts for the for the bridge. Mm -hmm. You know, they have real advanced machinist capability there. But he so the the. <laughs> the parts aren't original. They yeah. wear out. Yeah. You know? No, yeah. They, so they wear out over time, but basically the design um, oh, of that, yeah. Yeah, the design yeah. and construction. The Army of, owns the design. It was. Yeah. But I mean, of, like all the gears and everything. So yeah, uh, they used they, to remake them. Yeah. There was a, they just recently, within uh, the last couple of years, there was something that had, had broken and the, the factory still has the original, you know, molds and everything for them. And they were talking about re uh, replacing these with. I think one of the parts was a 3D printed part that they put in there, uh, but it was basically, it was the exact same configuration. It was just a more, more modern technology of making the part. Yeah. Uh, so be stronger, um, but uh, or the stronger than the original cast. He used to give me rides on it. You know? Oh, that's, yeah, that's pretty neat. One around, one around, yeah. Did you have a question? Uh, two of them, actually. Yeah. So is there any relation to this bridge and the one slightly downstream? <coughs> I know I'm going across Centennial Bridge because I always do that in the morning, so I don't get caught by the bridge. Yeah. A lot of times you'll see that one open as well, and they look almost identical, at least from that distance. Yeah, you know, I, I, um, I'm not 100% certain on, on Centennial Bridge. Um, I, I well, believe the, one, the rail bridge is down. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Bridge. Yeah, the, on the, the rail bridge. bridge. Um, because there's What's the uh, there's the rail bridge, there's the Centennial Bridge, and then there's the 280 Bridge all the way down. And those were all obviously uh, later additions, but I'm not 100% sure on the rail bridge on that one. But uh, it's, I don't know if it was just copying the design because it was such a strong design or if it was trying to mirror, you know, have all the bridges look. There's not a like, graphic deck on that one, on the wall. Yeah, one. yeah. But it's, it's roughly the same, you know, construction uh, style of that. But, uh, uh, or if that's just the, the, the style of construction that most railway bridges, I, and I, I apologize, it's, it's one of those things where it's, <laughs> For the most part, it sticks to Arsenal Island on, right. on things yeah. like that, but uh, uh, but it's um, I'll have to look into that. It's a good question. I sh I should know more on that one. And I don't know anything about that either. So, but if, I'm sure if you come down to special collections, we can help you answer. That. <laughs> then uh, yeah. question B. I'm assuming the swing span is electrically powered for turn now, but how was it powered in 1896? And then also the previous iterations, well, obviously there was certainly no electricity. Yeah, so I, I believe that the uh, the original, if I'm uh, if I remember correctly, the original was actually steam powered, uh, and now the 1856 and uh, 1866, uh, the 1856 had a steam engine that actually dri drove it, but I believe there was also uh, the original design showed mule power too, that you could actually have mules opening and closing it. So uh, again, you have to have a pretty you know well balanced or uh, evenly balanced bridge for that, but the uh, uh, 
I'm, all, I'm certain that the 1866 bridge, the second bridge, uh, there was a steam power motor that uh, drove uh, basically a chain system that opened and closed the bridge. But I, I'd have to check on the 1856 bridge. So, um, and then this one, uh, I think originally actually had a, a steam or uh, hydraulic motor, and then it was converted to electric uh, later on. But it, it still has uh, a good portion of it, I believe, is uh, hydraulically driven. Because that's one of the things. What's that? From the river or something else? Uh, from, uh, no, from uh, basically hy hydraulic pumps. Uh, oh, okay. So, and, and I think that those are, are gas powered. But uh, that's a good question, too. You're asking me a lot of good questions. I, I, should, I should probably know. Uh, but um, uh, yes, I have to find that one out. So, thank you. <laughs> it's uh, never been asked this before. Uh, I love how things work. Yeah. Well, and it's, and it's, for how the bridge works and it's worked so well for so long without needing any yeah. major alteration in any way. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's a testament to how it was originally built. Um, and, you know, by the Corps of Engineers, when they talked about the, uh, the maximum capacity that the bridge has, uh, has it, you know, it takes compared to what, uh, or the maximum capacity that it usually takes compared to what it could, it could take is, you know, showing the, uh, the foresight that, well, we built it to basically handle anything, you know, into the future. So uh, with very little mod need for modification and, and more so convenience, I think, on anything else is, you know, adapting to what now is driving on the, uh, the road surface instead of what was in 1896. Uh, and Andy, and from 1872 and said, we don't have to do this again in another 20 years. Yeah. And yeah. it frustrates civilians. And that's always a, an, an object of the Army to accomplish. <laughs> well, it's a. Uh, you know, we, we figure that after 126 years, you know, it's, it's going to show a little bit of signs of aging. And, and that's usually when, uh, like when they talk about the bridge going down or being closed for, for maintenance, it's uh, usually, I think it's part of the hydraulic system is that they, uh, um, and I don't know if that's the, the hydraulic system that actually raises those those platforms on either side, but uh, I'll have to talk, go down and talk to them more about uh, what that usually is. But, but still after 126, I think we're doing pretty good. And even though it's frustrating, but then you can you can shake your finger and say Abraham Lincoln did that because now you know <laughs> holding the bridge open because of the rail trap, and he should have fought a harder case. So, but uh, I, I give him too much grief for that. Uh, he only had a small part of that overall court case. So, but um, any other questions or uh, just a little comment about? Yeah, that. I, I was part of a um, an effort to close down the Arsenal Bridge. I, and it was in the 80s because I know Reagan was the president and he was, he thought it was good to, I think the movement came from the way that our government was treating the uh, Central American countries at the time. But uh, anyway, we tried to, to close it down by six standing in front of the cars that were coming into the arsenal. We probably only slowed it down an hour or so. They had to make big preparations so for people came in from Chicago and we tried to close it down. Yeah, well, it's it, just a little part of the history. That I <laughs> there you go. Well, it, there, a little piece of that history in the uh, history of the bridge. But uh, well, and I know over the uh, the years too is that uh, there's been several times that the the uh, the government. Um, and particularly the Corps of Engineers in this case, have looked at, well, the, you know, how expensive it is to maintain it, that it should be transferred to civilian authorities, but it's always seen that, well, this is a, a government resource that obviously benefits the Army as much as it does the civilian population, uh, and that so it should remain in Army inventory and be maintained by the Army itself, too. Um, so it's, again, um, you know, it's one of the last survivor, or one of the few survivors of Army-owned bridges over the time that have been able to survive being maintained and owned by the Army uh, as a whole. So, but, uh, well, yeah. Uh, so if there's any other questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them, but uh, thank you very much for coming. And, and I, I know this is a little bit shorter than normally, but, you know, I, I'm always usually trying to scramble at the end to fit everything in, and this one was a little bit shorter, but, uh, but next month, I promise that'll be different. The, uh, uh, Rock Island and the uh, the Civil War is is jam packed with all kinds of great information too. So, right. Thank you. Thank you.